Hello, this is Jack Jackson. This video will be examining some of the earliest um, important uh, mathematicians that we know the names of that uh, worked in Greek culture. So, except with, with the exception of a couple of Indian mathematicians, these are uh, some of the earliest mathematicians that we know by name. So let's start with Thales, Thales of Miletus, the father of mathematics. Thales of Miletus lived from approximately 624 BCE to about 547 BCE, or if you want to just be roughly, say, around 600 BCE. Miletus was a Greek city in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. I'll show you where it is on a map in a little bit. Now, of course, it's, it's an overstatement to call Thales the father of mathematics, but sometimes he gets that title or the father of geometry. Uh, and why? It's because he was the first specific person that we have in recorded history who is said to have insisted on deductive logic and proof. However, we really don't know how much he really knew. Um, records from that time are, are pretty sketchy. We have no existing works of his. What we have is comments from later historians and mathematicians that credit him with certain things. So he is considered the first Greek philosopher, scientist, and mathematician, uh, at least that's known by name. Uh, over here you'll see a, an a image of him, a bust. Now, you got to realize that most ancient mathematicians uh, have artist renderings of them, such as this that these images, in this case a sculpture, or in other cases drawings or paintings, are often from later periods, and this may bear little resemblance to the actual Thales, what he actually looked like. This is what an artist thought he looked like, uh, and, and it has, it's probably not even an artist from the same time period, so this is probably somebody much later looking back on it. So, uh, yeah, don't necessarily think that he looked just exactly like that. Um, we have evidence that Thales traveled a bit and in his travels picked up some mathematical knowledge, particularly he traveled to Egypt and from there he brought knowledge of geometry to Greece. He was an astronomer. We know that he predicted an eclipse. He studied philosophy. He studied geometry. Uh, some of the things that he is said to have done is measured the heights of the pyramids using shadows. So he was, uh, he knew something about similar triangles, or uh, he was at least very close to understanding uh, the theory of similar triangles and proportions. And he was one of the first to try to explain reasons for natural phenomena. A lot of times before this, and even, even after this, people had the feeling that uh, natural phenomena were just cover caused by some uh, mystical uh, phenomena. Maybe the gods were, were playing around with things. Uh, and he was the first to try to explain why some of these phenomena happen naturally. He was the earliest of a group of folks that were uh, named the seven sages of ancient Greece. Uh, he's the main one of them that was got on there mainly just for his, his uh, intellectual pursuits and not political pursuits. He did dabble in some pol pol politics, uh, but he was, he was mainly on this list because of his um, science, philosophy, and mathematical expertise. He's credited with five theorems from geometry. I'm going to state them more in a modern language. A circle is bisected by any diameter. The base of an isosceles triangle, base, the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. Vertical angles are congruent, and two triangles are congruent if they have two pairs of corresponding congruent angles and one pair of corresponding uh, congruent sides. So in other words, the AAS and the ASA, angle-angle side and angle-side angle theorems. And the fifth one is an inscribed angle intersecting a semicircle is a right angle. So these five theorems were, again, credited to him that he not only figured them out and stated them, but they actually proved them as well. So he was one of the first to insist on this idea of proof. 
And so that's why, you know, he maybe deserves this name, Father of Mathematics. Um, he was uh, the earliest Greek person that we have a name of. Um, there's only just a few uh, mathematicians from India that predate him that we know by name. He was the teacher of a another important and influential mathematician named uh, Anaximander, who also lived in Miletus. Uh, Anaximander's dates uh, born around 611 BCE, died around 546 BCE. One of the things that's interesting about Anaximander is that he proposed the heliocentric model of the universe, that is, a model of the universe, or at least the solar system, where we have the sun at the center and the planets going around the sun. Um, think about that. This, uh, this got to some, um, many centuries later, uh, this got some, some European scientists in trouble with the church when they proposed the heliocentric model. Uh, the, the other model, of course, was a, was a geocentric where the earth was the center of the, of the solar system. Uh, here's a map of the region, and just so here's here's the main Greece homeland here, but the, all of this area was considered Greece, and right over in here you're going to see uh, Miletus on this island just off of Asia Minor. Current this of course this is current day Turkey, and so here's Miletus right there. It was near some other. Let's see what are some other cities that were nearby. Uh, uh, Halicarnassus, Ephesus up here, Rhodes was big here. Rhodes is famous for its giant statue there, the Colossus of Rhodes, and so forth. And of course, we're a little ways over here to, uh, say, to Athens here. So that's where uh, this island here and this, this city state, Miletus, that is where uh, we have the first mathematician by name Thales. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is Pythagoras of Samos, and Samos is right here. It's an other, another island very close to Milet Miletus, in fact, and so that's where Pythagoras uh, started out. It's where he was born and where he started his work, and it's notice it's close to where Thales was. So Pythagoras lived around 570 BCE to 590 BCE, or around 500 BCE. But notice he did, his dates do overlap with those of Thales and uh, Anaximander. And he is said to have visited them in Miletus and learned a lot from Thales and particularly Anaximander. And that may have got his uh, big start in mathematics was learning there. He's also said to have visited Egypt and learned there as well. Now remember, uh, you know, the Egyptians had an older culture. This is, they would have had some, some uh, mathematical knowledge there that uh, some of these early Greek mathematicians would have gone there to, to learn. Uh, and, but then eventually the Greek mathematics overtook the mathematics from uh the, the surrounding area there. Now, Pythagoras moved to Italy around 518 BCE. Uh, he lived uh, in, and uh, worked in a place called Croton. Now, before he did that, he actually formed a semi-secret quasi-religious society or a cult of mathematicians, musicians, philosophers. And he first did this uh, in Samos, and then he, he, with his society, his cult, moved to uh, Croton. So just looking back at the map, uh, remember he started over here at Samos. After he found his society there for a while, they moved all the way over here to Croton, here in what's now uh, the southern part of, of Italy. So uh, the Pythagoreans, think of them in both in Samos and later in Croton. Okay, um, 
this this uh, society of the Pythagoreans is is a pretty interesting little uh, group. <clears throat> they were, um, for one thing, they they had a tendency to not uh, take as much personal credit for things. So it's a little hard to distinguish what actually Pythagoras uh, was able to do versus what some of the other Pythagoreans did. But this uh, group of Pythagoreans had at least two levels to them. They had the Augusti and the math uh, Mathematici. And the Augusti was more of the um, outer circle. It was more public. Uh, visitors could perhaps come in and, and be part of that group, and they were told certain things. But the Mathematici were, were a more, uh, that was the inner circle. And that was the, the really highly secret society. And in some cases, the knowledge that they had there, they had a higher knowledge that they didn't let out of that society, uh, that, that inner circle. Okay. So what kinds of things did they do? Well, one of the things that they did was, was music. Okay. Uh, Pythagoras was apparently himself a, an accomplished musician who then got interested in mathematics. And one of the things that he did is he used mathematics to try to describe music. And so really that makes him the founder of music theory. Uh, one of the things that he found uh, was the consonants of ratios. Uh, consonants in music was given by ratios of small number, natural number frequencies, or, or, or same thing for links in a string. So for example, uh, this this makes the, the the foundation of not music theory and acoustics. So, so for example, you take a string and you you tighten it so that when you pluck it, it pr produces a pitch, a a musical sound. And so it has a certain frequency of vibration that causes that. Well, you found that if you if you could put your finger exactly halfway there, and pluck the pluck one side of the string, so now the string is exactly half as long, or just make a string that's half as long that what happened is the frequency doubled as you half the length of the string. And what that did for the music, for the sound of it, is it raised the pitch what we call one octave. And so that, that octave became the most consonant of sounds. In other words, it sounded most the same. Okay. And uh, what happened with that is it's so consonant that, in fact, today we call it the same note, like, like the same letter name. So we might have a, say, a, a pitch of a C and then an octave let higher when you double the frequency or half the length of the string, you have another C, an octave higher. And then other things like, so the next ratio, so if you did a third, that's sort of the next smallest ratio there, you get a perfect fifth. Actually, you get, a, you get an octave and a perfect fifth and, and a ratio there of of that so that's the perfect fifth is the next most constant ratio and then the next one would be if you do a fourth that's going up two octaves uh, but a fifth would be uh, two octaves and a perfect fourth so a perfect fourth would be the the next most constant interval and then so forth uh, there's there's more to it than that but basically this performed the basis of the er most earliest num uh, music theory they also did early number theory, and they felt that numbers had mystical properties. They even thought that everything can be represented by a number, and by that they meant a natural number or a rational number. And so the music theory was one of their most um, specific examples of that. And so they felt like the sphere was the most uh, perfect shape. And they'll talk about, and music was, was one of the most perfect things. So they talk about the music of the spheres, that the universe was put together with these basic mathematical relationships. And they associated numbers with nature in a very mystical kind of way. And so um, that's, that's why, you know, this is, this is very mystical type of a, of a cult as well, and religious kind of a cult or group or society. Uh, as well as just being an intellectual uh, uh, pursuit. Um, one of the things that uh, apparently there's a story that they did, well, they definitely did discover 
irrational numbers. Now, whether Pythagoras did this or, or probably the later Pythagoreans actually did this. And this just sent shockwaves through their society because they felt like everything ought to be expressed in terms of a rational number. And the very existence of irrational numbers just just didn't make sense. And so, of course, the, the most basic, easiest uh, irrational number perhaps to think about is when you take a right isosceles triangle that has sides of length 1, 1, and the other one we now know has a length of the square root of 2, which actually turns out to be an irrational number. And so they wanted to try to be able to take that hypotenuse there and make it a multiple of one of the sides, make them or at least, or at least a, if not a multiple, a at least a nat rational number multiple, make the proportional in that sense. And then they found out somehow they, they were able to discover that that can't be done. And uh, the, the, I, the, the, the story, perhaps uh, apocryphal story, perhaps not really true, uh, or perhaps maybe it was true, I don't know, is that that the person who found that uh, actually fled with this knowledge and let it out of the society and was eventually, uh, you know, thrown overboard on a ship and, and drowned because of, of this, of letting this, finding out this scandalous knowledge and then letting it out of the, uh, to the public. But in any event, the Pythagoreans then eventually did discover that they're irrational numbers, which actually put a real wrench in their, in their plans of, of trying to describe a uh, number theory um, which wasn't resolved till a little bit later. Uh, Pythagoras is probably most famously uh, known for the Pythagorean theorem, which bears his name. But we've already talked about this in earlier videos that the Pythagorean theorem was known to others uh, before this, including folks in China and, and probably in the Babylonians knew it at least a thousand years earlier. So... Um, you know that there was there was uh, definitely it would be wrong to say that he came up with the Pythagorean theorem uh, on his own. Uh, however, he might have been the first to actually write a formal proof of it. Um, certainly, and because of that, that might be why his name gets associated with that theorem. He was primarily a philosopher. He was a mathematician, but probably more of a philosopher. Um, he, the Pythagoreans taught that the earth is spherical. Some of the Pythagoreans thought that the sun was the center of the universe. Uh, notice how that, that uh, theory was then later discarded before it actually was picked up much later. Um, mathematics was considered to glorify the human spirit through a mystical comp, comp, uh, templation of the good and the beautiful. So, uh, you know, the idea, the, you know, again, primarily a philosopher, he's mainly after this uh, philosophical, religious idea of this mystical contemplation, and mathematics was the, the best example of that, um, with probably music being a close second. Uh, Pythagorean society expanded rapidly after 500 BCE. Uh, but then it was violently suppressed in 560 BCE. They had a, basically a raid that came in and just basically killed a bunch of them, dispersed the ones that were left. A few of them that survived and made it back more to the, the Greek homeland. But, um, you know, and so some of the ideas still were, out, were back out there, but it was uh, suppressed. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, I would mention mathematics and music here. Uh, I'm both a mathematician and a musician. Mathematics and music is, uh, were considered two, two branches of kind of the same thing. Uh, the muses, the nine muses in, in Greek mythology were over various things in the arts, and, and the same muse was over mathematics as was over music. Here's a quote uh, from Aristotle, Metaphysics, Aristotle being a little later, and uh, he said they, the Pythagoreans, thought that they found in numbers more than in fire, earth, or water many resemblances to, to things which are and become. Thus, such and such an attribute of numbers is justice, another is soul and mind, another is opportunity, 
and so on. And again, they saw in numbers the attributes and ratios of the musical scales. Since then, all things seem in their whole nature to be assimilated to numbers, while numbers seem to be the first things in the whole of nature, they suppose the elements of numbers to be the elements of all things, and the whole heaven to be a musical scale and a number. So, you know, see, they think from that, you can see that they thought that mathematics was, was very important in describing the fundamental nature of reality, uh, but they also kind of did it in kind of a, a mystical uh, way. There's a, a bust of Pythagoras, but once again, uh, this would have been done by somebody later, so we don't really know who, or I mean, what he actually looked like. The next mathematician I want to mention, and there, there are others that we know by name in between here, but I'm just going to bring out a few of them, was Zeno of Elia. Uh, it, uh, is it, he, his, he was from what would be present-day southern Italy. Um, well, let's just go back to the map and see if we can find that. And, uh, yeah, it's not on here, but it was down here in the southern part of Italy. And one of the things that he was most famous for were his paradoxes. He had about 40 paradoxes of these, and they all kind of dealt with sort of the same kind of thing. They dealt with questions about... Uh, the understanding of the infinitely big and the infinitesimally small and how this related especially to motion. So here's a quote, there is no motion because that which is moved must arise at the middle of its course before it arrives at the end. In attempting to move point A to point B, one must first pass the midpoint of the line segment AB, but to do this one must first pass the quarter point of that distance. And but but first one must pass the eighth point ad infinitum. And so therefore, Zeno concludes, motion cannot begin. You can never shoot an arrow. Or another particular way that they phrased this was in, this, in the, uh, this, uh, this paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. So let's see if we can kind of explain this, this particular one. So basically, Achilles was a mythological hero from... from uh, from the story of the, the, the fall of Troy. And uh, he is really fast, fast, fast runner, okay? So let's say he's going to have a race with a really slow animal, say the tortoise. And so, you know, Achilles is going to be sporting. He gives the tortoise a head start. So let's say they're going to run 100 meters. And he lets the tortoise get a head start. So the tortoise gets gets to start at the 50 meter mark. I say go. And Achilles takes off running. Well, at some point, Achilles has to get to 50 meters. He has to get halfway. Well, meanwhile, that's going to take some time. And what he does, the tortoise then has moved forward. So he's still got a head start. May not be 50 meters anymore, but he's still got a head start. And then, so then it, time goes on. Well, Achilles gets to where that tortoise was whenever the tor tortoise was at, whenever Achilles was at 50 meters, wherever the tortoise was there, it takes some amount of time for Achilles to get to that spot. And meanwhile, the tortoise has moved a little bit further. And then, so then how about the next stage? Well, it takes a little time for Achilles to get to where the tortoise was there. Meanwhile, the tortoise has moved a little bit further. And so forth. And the idea is, well, the Achilles can never catch the tortoise. That's the paradox. Wait a minute. But wait a minute. The paradox is, of course, paradox is, is something when you, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like it's got to be true, but you know it's got to be false as well. So it's both true and false. That's a paradox. So, um, of course, the, the, real, the reality we know that Achilles is going to be, be able to catch up with the tortoise. And... Um, probably before the end of the race. So what's wrong? How do we resolve this? And uh, and the, the paradoxes like this were was not really fully resolved until we came up with the concept of a limit uh, much, much later. 
And so this is related very, you know, very much to the ideas of calculus. And the idea uh, that you probably studied uh, in, in calculus too, perhaps, that you can add up infinitely many things, in this case, like say the fractions, a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth, and so forth, you can add up infinitely many things and get a finite number. Or that, that you could take these infinitely many stages and actually accomplish this amount of race in a finite amount of time. So you've broken up this race into infinitely many stages, but summing up those infinitely many pieces can be resolved into a finite amount of time. And so that's it takes the concept of limit to really fully uh, understand what was going on there. And so uh, Zeno actually kind of, you know, at least got us thinking about these ideas uh, much, much, uh, you know, a long time ago, right? Um, so the early, uh, early 5th century BCE. Now, if you think about this, this is pretty deep stuff here, right? I mean, in terms of at least a philosophy of mathematics. So this shows you that mathematicians at this time were thinking very deeply about the whole structure of mathematics. What does a number really mean? What, is, what does motion really mean? How can we describe it? Uh, you know, and this, is, this has come a long way from just a practical uh, application. Right. So, uh, so you know, mathematics has come come a long way at this point. The next one I want to talk about is uh, Eudoxus of Snidus. He was a mathematician and astronomer of the early Greek period. He lived from about 409 BCE to 355 BCE. Now he studied in Croton with the Pythagoreans. So there he would have studied music and number theory. He also studied in Sicily. And there he studied medicine, among other things. He went to Athens and studied probably several different things there. And he made trips to Egypt studying geometry and astronomy. He, at the time he was at Athens, he would have been in the, in the vicinity of uh, Plato and his academy. So that's... We'll talk a little bit about Plato in the next video. Uh, but he was a much more accomplished mathematician than Plato. In fact, he was probably the best mathematician in the world uh, had ever seen up to that point. Um, he ended up establishing a successful school. And uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Cyzicus, which is in northwestern Asia Minor. He eventually uh, re returned to Snidus and built an observatory. Here's a, uh, a um, sundial that he made that's still in existence. What were some of the mathematical things that he did? Well, one of the things that he worked on was the theory of proportions. So this, in, in this theory of proportions, one of the things he was able to do is, uh, well, talk about a lot of bit about different things and solving things for proportions. But in a way, he's, his theoretical work with this helped explain irrational links. As we talked about, once the Pythagoreans decided and found out that uh, the irrational numbers existed, that there were some links that you couldn't express as a ratio of other basic links that gave that that really really gave people a problem about to understand what what's really meant by number and and to the Greeks numbers were links okay and they also felt well numbers ought to be natural numbers and and then we found these irrational links well what does that mean does that mean we don't have they're, they're not really numbers or what well uh, Eudoxus was able to kind of take irrational links and put them in the context of number and uh, and give some explanation for that. Uh, this actually foreshadowed later ideas and analysis. He foreshadowed several ideas. Uh, these this this uh, theory of proportions uh, was an inspiration for the later idea of Dedekind cuts, much much later, uh, which would 
be one way of defining the real number systems. He also had another thing that foreshadowed some later ideas in calculus and analysis, and this is called his method of exhaustion. It was a form of proof that he applied uh, mainly to areas, and uh, it was basically an early form of integration. So an example of that is you, use, you could use the uh, method of exhaustion to find the area of a circle. Take a circle and inscribe a regular polygon. Then let the polygon have more and more and more and more sides. Well, the polygon is going to have a smaller area than the circle, but you have a little leftover area. And as the number of sides got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, that leftover area got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that uh, if you sort of inc uh, let this process go on ad infinitum, then the, uh, the difference is exhausted as the number of sides increase. So this is a basic limit idea. So he was basically doing this, this one of the, in a way you'd say he was doing some sort of calculus uh, way back, way back. So the roots of calculus go back at least as far as Eudoxus. And Archimedes, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, we'll, st we'll talk about him in a few videos down the road. Um, he was able to take this method of exhaustion and use it to prove many, many theorems. We'll talk a little bit in, later about uh, Euclid and the Elements, which is a very, very important book. And um, the work of Eudoxus is featured in some of the Elements and perhaps uh, influenced them quite a bit. And especially in Book 5, there's definitely... Uh, some some parts of that that are uh, labeled with the name of Eudoxus, so he gets some credit for it there. Uh, in addition to mathematics, he was an astronomer. He mapped the stars, uh, particularly after he got to back back to Sinaitis. Uh, in the later part of his life, he built a, uh, a an observatory there, and so he uh, mapped stars there. Again, he had a geocentric planetary system uh, based on nested spheres. So he tried to come up with this idea, uh, possibly because of his influence from the uh, studying with the Pythagoreans, thinking of the spheres as, as, a, as a, a sacred, uh, perfect shape. He was able to try to try to uh, describe the uh, universe as the sun in the center and spheres moving around that. Now, it's not clear if he actually thought of these as actual physical spheres or just the, that the planets moved around these spheres. Um, and part of this was an attempt to explain the motion of the planets. Now, when you think about this, uh, astronomy and mathematics went in hand, hand in hand a lot in this ancient mathematics and actually through way, way into, the, into the future as well. Because these, um, when you look at the, the stars, up at the stars, they apparently move around, as does the moon, the sun, and so forth. And the planets are really crazy because they don't move like the stars do, the apparent motion. Whereas the stars are, are pretty fixed in their circular path, the planets will go move one way and then they'll turn around and go backwards for a while. It's called retrograde motion. And so uh, the word planet actually means wanderers. So you got these little wanderers out there, and they could see uh, the you know the lights from the planets for for several planets. And and how did they explain that? And so that uh, that led to a lot of really interesting mathematics being created to help describe that. And uh, Eudoxus was one of the first to really give. Uh, an attempt at really describing how this works. However, his was an abstract model and not really tested with actual data. Um, had, had he actually tested it with a lot of the actual data that uh, he would have found that his model didn't work. Uh, but at least it was a, a, a good first attempt. And of course, his idea of a geocentric planetary system we now know is correct. Uh, Finally, let me mention that he also wrote a book about the geography and cultures of the Mediterranean region. We've already talked about the fact that he traveled quite a bit around the area 
he talks, uh, you know, somewhat extensively about the Pythagoreans, which, of course, he knew about because he studied there with them for a while. And um, so he had some maps of the region that he drew, and he talks about the different peoples that lived in the different places. So uh, interesting guy was one of the greatest mathematicians of the earliest period and influenced some of the work that was to come later.